So today we're at the uh, 22nd International Conference on Comparative Cognition, and this year we're celebrating Dr. Ed Wasserman and his career and a lot of the research accomplishments that he's made, and today we're lucky enough to have him with us and ask him a few questions about his career and his accomplishments. It's and fun. It's fun. Thanks for coming today, Ed. So uh, let me start with, uh, you've done a lot of different areas in your career, uh, visual perception, concept learning, causation. Would you like to talk about that and some of the, the key, key areas that kind of got you going in that and some of the landmark papers that you've done over the years? Well, those particular areas have been pretty central to, to my work. The, uh, the study of visual concepts is one about which I'm going to speak here tomorrow. It was certainly the case that that field got started uh, by Hernstein's pioneering research. Uh, I had talked about that research, as have many of us over the years in class, and it always seemed to me that the experiments were pregnant with possibility, but I hadn't really moved very far, I hadn't taken the ball very far down the field. And the biggest problem was that there hadn't been anything other than these presence-absence discriminations, which bear no resemblance whatsoever to natural categorization of behavior. And so uh, that said to me, there's more that can be done. And look, the rest is history. We did, in fact, do more and are still doing more. And uh, we can talk more about that uh, here or elsewhere. Uh, another area of important research involves visual perception, which, it turns out, is linked very closely to the interest in concept learning. because. Having shown that pigeons, for instance, seem to engage in something approximating conceptual behavior, the question was, well, what is it they're seeing in the images that allow them to do this? Uh, that was, as they used to say in the old days, the $64,000 question. And it turns out that as I was getting interested in this work, Irv Biederman uh, was publishing a paper on uh, what he considered to be the perceptual irreducibles of, of uh, vision and cognition, and so uh, it seemed there another important opportunity to link up with Irv and to begin comparative studies of uh, visual perception and, and uh, object recognition, which we did. We had funding for 22 years, and uh, I think we made some progress along those lines. Uh, a third, the third area that you mentioned involved causation. And although it doesn't seem like there would be any particular connection to what I've just talked about, the fact of the matter is I began doing work in auto shaping, and at the time our hero was Herb Jenkins. But I discovered in uh, some conversations with my advisor, Elliot Hurst, that Herb had done experiments in human causal judgment. And they seemed to show that, unlike rats, we weren't very good at determining contingency relations. Well, it seemed preposterous that rats would outperform us, uh, and uh, it seemed also to me that the methods were at fault, that something very much like the animal conditioning techniques that had been used so effectively with rats and pigeons might be deployed to, with people as well. And so we happened to get started on that realm. We began with studying response outcome relations, and uh, had considerable success and did a great number of other experiments along the line. But that work really did spring from one of the heroes of uh, animal learning, Kurt Jenkins, who had earlier dabbled in human causal judgment. Yeah, same thing. So, so you've had a, a number of articles in, in each of these areas. Are, are there any that, in your mind that kind of stand out as some of your favorite ones that you think have been to you as the most important ones in helping shape the future? Of my own or other people? Well, both. Oh, well, it was certainly the case that Hernstein's original experiment was, was, was terrific, and he, although most people don't cite them, had written many others that included additional controls, like the pseudo-categorization procedure, had uh, done other things to uh, manipulate the stimuli, but he had found, for instance, that pigeons didn't seem very effectively to categorize human-made objects well, this was another one of those curiosities. I don't know anybody who's really seized upon this, but when we published our first papers in 1988, it turned out that we included both two natural and two artificial categories. The pigeons had no difficulty learning them. The answer has to obviously be in the stimuli, uh, whether or not the 
wheeled vehicles were a coherent enough category uh, is arguable since we don't have access to the stimuli that Herrnstein used or bottles. It's not clear what bottles he might have chosen. But we've gone on to study many different categories and, and have never found any obvious difference. Now, if you're talking about a favorite paper within that realm, I'd have to say the most recent paper that we published is now my favorite. I work very closely with uh, Dan Brooks, one of my former students, and my colleague, Bob McMurray. And uh, as you'll hear more tomorrow, we've gotten pigeons to categorize concurrently in the same session, 16 different categories of objects, uh, half of which are human-made, half of them are not. When we moved up from four where we began, uh, it's perhaps not a prodigious number, but the stimuli in our training setup equaling 128 was substantial, and we discovered that there were coherences among the stimuli and the speed of learning. We found generalizations and novel instances. We found other rich details by looking uh, backward in doing lag analyses in terms of the possibility that both strengthening correct and weakening incorrect associations were participating. And that seemed like a, a, an interesting set of data that matched pretty closely what we were learning about children's learning words. And so uh, that cognition paper that just came out is one that we're, we're really pleased with and published in cognition in order to try to make contact with a broader community. Uh, always we seem to be in our little world and breaking out of it is important. So, so picking up on that, I know that's been a big, important issue for you and, and many of us. So, and we've had difficulty over the years to do that. How do you, is there a way we can solve that? Can, how do we get ourselves out there? And, and I know you've thought about this a long time. What can we do now? What should we do? Well, long ago, one of the very first meetings we had, I gave a little uh, strategy, a tip sheet about the things that we might do. And it wasn't just to try to egg my colleagues on. It was also to encourage my, me to follow my own advice. And one of them was to reach out to other communities, uh, collaborate with other scientists, look for intellectual compatibilities. And so I think they're there. I think developmental is a, is a beautiful one. I not only collaborate now with Bob McMurray at, at Iowa, but with Vladimir Slutsky at Ohio State. We have papers. And we've published one. We hope to publish more uh, papers comparing you know, children and pigeons and, and their learning of both supervised and unsupervised categories. This is going to be another theme we haven't touched much in our field with upon unsupervised learning. Almost everything we do requires reward and non-reward. You can beat the animal over the head to tell us what it's understanding about the world. But there may be other shrewder ways to do so. And so looking to other collaborators, neuroscience collaborators are another way to go on. And I, I'm collaborating with John Freeman. We're doing research on rat categorization now. We've got rats to categorize photographs in much the same way as pigeons have. Contrary to some opinion, rats can see. It's <laughs> useful to pick the ones with pigmented eyes. Uh, but uh, this is another really rich area for collaboration. If neuroscientists could really appreciate how far we've gone in the analysis of cognition, they wouldn't probably still be doing eye conditioning. Mm -hmm. I mean, no offense to my colleague Dory Gormazano, I mean, that, that button has been pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed. But if we really want to understand more of the richness of cognition, which is what our community is dedicated to, we have to have the neuroscience folks coming along. And I know we're trying to meet in connection with the Society for Neuroscience. That may be perhaps too big a bite to take at once. There is another group, the cognitive neuroscience community, and maybe there are more convivial bunch, but we really have to do something. We, uh, we are, well, there are, let's say, forces arrayed against us uh, in terms of funding and, uh, and uh, popular movements that make it difficult, to, let's say, to achieve our ends as easily as we might otherwise. So one of the things I've really enjoyed reading your articles over the years is there's, there's often a little bit of history that you, you, you've dug up and kind of brought to a contemporary field. So I wanted to ask you, like, who are some of your favorite scientists over your, like, when you look back, who are the people that you like, you love to read that have really influenced your thinking? Well, in the first place, this issue of history is, is really important. I started in physics, and, you know, physics has 
as have other fields become the flavor of the week. Uh, people are trained with absolutely no appreciation whatsoever of the groundbreaking path making experiments in the field. They're so caught up with the current technology and, and buzzwords that they have no connection to where the field came from. And so I always try to have some historical connection, largely because it's been extremely edifying to me to see where the issues are that we're studying, where they came from. And without that appreciation, I don't think we're doing our job as scientists or as educators. And so I think it's, it's pretty important that we try our best to discover those roots. In terms of famous people, uh, I'm going to be the most boring <laughs> interviewee uh, imaginable. I'm going to say Darwin, uh, Pavlov, and Skinner are the absolute favorites. Uh, there's simply no way to underestimate their importance. Uh, Darwin began our field uh, by collecting anecdotes. He didn't have anything much better. His protege, Romanus, helped collect those anecdotes. And when Darwin died, those were bequeathed to him, and he included those in his uh, first uh, book that he had written toward the end of the, uh, of the 19th century. Uh, he tried doing a little bit in the way of research, but not so much. His countryman, Hobhaus, did some experiments on learning and problem solving using zoo animals. But uh, it was Lloyd Morgan that really kicked the Got, you know, got the field kick-started in terms of figuring out how to do experiments using animal models, using chicks where you can control prior experience. So although those three were the big names, there are other people that are foundational and perhaps even more instrumental in how it is we came to do what it is we do as a science. I think Lloyd Morgan, in terms of forming the distinction between habit and instinct, in terms of doing these uh, early learning experiments, controlling developmental history, isolating the baby chicks from the mother, all those things are, where would we be without that? You just can't even imagine the feeling. And yet, I don't think a single one of our students will have read anything by Lloyd Morgan. And that's sad. Yeah, so, so, uh, so how do we solve that problem? Because, you know, the history is getting lost, right? Is, is it a curriculum issue, or is it just an interest issue? What, what do we do? Well, I, well, I can only, as one voice, try to encourage colleagues to do some further reading. It's not like I'm castigating them. I, I'm always looking up something and finding something new. The very end of the talk I'll give tomorrow will give you a, a real shock when you see who was one of the great <laughs> thinkers in animal cognition. Uh, all kinds of people have participated and uh, discovering them is, is joyous. It's fun. I mean, our field should be fun. And doing these historical uh, sojourns is it's really a lot of fun and it's rewarding. I always treasure up something that I and virtually nobody else will know. <laughs> and, and that you can look so smart when you when you pick something up like that because they'll say, how'd you find that? And it just, it just goes, Googling. <laughs> <laughs> Google is our, one of our best friends. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I have discovered some very interesting historical tidbits and they do enrich the story. When people say something about my papers, they'll always or often comment that well, it certainly got off to a good start. <laughs> I don't know how it's all going to end. But uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's part of the process. We don't have history courses in our curricula anymore. Uh, most places don't. Uh, the older you get, the more often you're asked to do it. But uh, I just can't. I don't really know enough. Uh, you may think that I know more than most, and that may be true, but it isn't really nearly enough to, to mount a real full scale course. I grew up with uh, Hill Garden Bauer. Uh, that was that was theories of learning to me, and uh, after that, uh, that book kind of got funny and disappeared. And there haven't been too many. Sperling, I think, has a book that's come out, but uh, it's the field moves too fast. They say for people to be worried about history, and so I think we're in the position of committing those same sins that I saw uh, that the physics and, and the chemistry doing, you know, missing out on the richness of their own history. So let's let's go back some years. Sure. So what got you, what got you motivated to go into psychology? What, what were the when you look back, what are those kind of key moments or moments? Sure. So these are always fun stories because we never foresee the end of our life. It's always a series of random events that you know, take us where we are. I 
always loved animals. My brother and I had kept many animals, none had fur. My mother had a decided aversion to animals with fur. They tend to also become with teeth <laughs> and, so, and claws. So these are things that kind of uh, shoot her away. But we had many different birds and fish and uh, lizards and frogs and tortoises and so all those, this is cool stuff. And uh, I was always interested in animals. I had biology in high school, but perhaps because of a recency effect with having chemistry and physics, I decided I'd go into physics and uh, did at UCLA begin in physics and quickly discovered that it wasn't all that much fun. Didn't know what I wanted to do. I must have gone through the general catalog a you know, hundred times trying to find something. I decided to just plunge, take all the psychology that I could. We switched to the quarter system at that time. So I was able to take quite a cafeteria mm -hmm. of coursework. And I enjoyed all of that. I had the most programs, courses in perception and personality and social psychology. And those were fun. But I took the course in learning. John Houston taught the course. And he had a, dis a very nice approach. It was an integrated course, human and animal learning. He had done research with uh, Postman and Melton. He was really well versed in the field. He was a fine teacher. And it said to me that the science of behavior was possible. Emphasize the word science. Okay? And I always wanted to be a scientist, and well, behavior is really interesting. We don't know that much about it. And look, there are animals in this too. So I started doing research, not with animals, but with people and verbal learning. I did an honors thesis with John Houston, and I did other research with Bernie Weiner, who at the time was interested in motivation and memory. Uh, Glucksberg and King came out with a paper in Science on an experimental analog of motivated forgetting. The question was, if you were given instructions to forget, could you pay people then later to remember, and what effect might that incentive have? And I said, we can do an animal experiment like that. And so Bernie said, great, we started. Uh, the last summer I was in UCLA, we ran rats. Couldn't teach a matching the sample for the life of me. <laughs> and uh, said, well, that was an interesting experience. I went to graduate school in Indiana. I had a fellowship, that was nice, but I also got a, a offered extra money uh, by Rich Schifrin, who started at the same time, to do more verbal learning. And, all right, so this is a choice point in the maze, okay? Uh, I said, I really want to focus on animal behavior. I, I gave it a try, it didn't work, but I don't want to take the easy way out. Let me try doing a study uh, with animals. So I did, I ran a first uh, semester project with rats, published it in science, mm -hmm. yay me, <laughs> uh, with a little help from a friend, Dave Thomas, and uh, it turned out great. Uh, and I felt, all right, now I'm ready to do stuff. But my advisor left, uh, Don Jensen. I then worked with Jim Dinsmore on observing behavior, started working with pigeons. I uh, thought pigeons were, were terrific experimental animals. I loved observing behavior. The study of attention and learning really was a popular one. I had also you know, done some work with Tom Travasso at UCLA, and the, the, at the time, you know, Sutherland and McIntosh had come out, Lovejoy, Zeman and House, all these classics in attention and discrimination learning, and I thought, oh, this is a really good way to go. And then uh, Elliot Hurst was hired, and I said, well, that, that's, that's a lab where I can have more, a little more freedom to things that I might like to try. I had, we had read his work on inhibition for comps and said, all right, let's, give, let's see what's happening there. So I joined his lab and I had my one box. I got my <laughs> own pigeon box. That, that, that was a big increase for me. And uh, here's the coincidence, coincidence again. Herb Jenkins was going to give a colloquium. Uh, we had heard about auto shaping and I said, well, let's try it. Let me see if I can get it. Just to, convince myself that that might be good. And it might be a good uh, background for trying the matching the sample to study that I wanted to get to work with rats to work with pigeons. So I tried the auto-shaping experiment, expecting fully that it would work, and it bombed and failed. Pigeons didn't pack. And that was really disturbing. And uh, before I told Elliot that <laughs> the first experiment I had tried was a bust, I decided to try to figure it out. And I watched the pigeons. And what I had done different from Herb Jenkins and Brown, the 
was to try to have no light in the box other than the key light. So the key light would come on, signal food, and the pigeon would look around and see that the light had come on and get all excited, but not move toward the, the lighted key. It, 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 the food when it came. What's that about? So it dawned on me, well, maybe they have to focus their attention, if you will, on the source of the light. And the best way to do that is to turn the house light on because I went back into the method section and they had always used the house light. So I turned the house light on and most of the pigeons started there. And that told me uh, a few things, that there were controls that were important, that you could either succeed or fail by relatively simple experimental modifications. And uh, I said, okay, this is something where I, this is a field where I might be able to do something. That, uh, that paper got published as well. And it was a good experience all the way around. I got now to, you know, to see psychology in action when you can really make a discovery. So that's great. So let's move to today. So the young scholars of the world, you know, if you're going to give them advice on what they should do, they're, they're, they they want to be scientists. What do you tell them? Areas should psychology be their future? Animal cognition be their future? What, what, are, what would you tell them? I would never tell people to turn away from where their passion lies. The, the most important single thing there is to tell a young scholar is pursue what you love. This is something you love. Work hard at it. Do it well. Somehow things will work out. That being said, you can enhance your likelihood of success by doing such things as learning more broadly about the problem that you're studying. If there are important human parallels developmental connections, go for them. Uh, don't think that you're necessarily going to be able to do exactly what we're doing in the lab now. Be sufficiently broadly trained that you could be a good methodologist, statistician, experimental psychologist in being interested in cognition generally, and then see where that might take you. So uh, students of mine have wound up in several different places. Uh, one of them you know is Ramesh Bhatt. He did a postdoc not only with Tony Wright, but he did a postdoc with Carolyn Roby Collier. So he had work, he'd done work with pigeons with me, with primates with Tony, with uh, babies with Carolyn, and now he's in Kentucky. He's a full professor and he studies uh, perception and cognition in infants. And he's a good methodologist, statistician, experimental psychologist. He's got the background. He'll always have an appreciation, I'm sure, for the comparative work. And, uh, and that's just fine. We don't have to clone ourselves, but if there are those who really want to pursue this, they can. You know, and, uh, several people have and will continue. And uh, we have to do our best to make the opportunity for them. Because if we don't give them the opportunity, then who's going to give it to them? So, so let's move to our field of comparative cognition. So what do you think the issues are that we need to address now and into the future? Where, where do you see our field progressing? Into? These are the hot topics. These are the things we need. I wish I had a lot of insight there. I don't. I tend, uh, by and large, to follow the data. Uh, in some cases, they take me places I hadn't anticipated. Uh, so for instance, as an example, I said I was interested in motivation and memory. I tried to teach rats to match, to match the sample, but I never got beyond that. The, the key part of the experiment was going to be having taught them matching the sample, provide cues, incentives, uh, say a signal for food or no food, presented prior to the sample, during the sample, during the retention, at the time of retrieval. This was going to be the, the project that I was going to understand. But then I learned about auto shipping and why was auto shipping really that interesting? Not only because Herb Jenkins was coming to Indiana, but also because if there were going to be directed responses that the signals for food were going to uh, elicit, that was really going to uh, contaminate the results that I was going to get. So I was going to have to figure out whether that really was a, a realistic fear. And if it were, consider other alternatives, say using auditory stimuli, diffuse visual stimuli. I mean, I, I saw where I needed to be going, but I had to worry about that contamination. Well, then turns out the contamination, auto shaping, I studied for 10 years. So <laughs> if you'd asked me, well, Ed, what you really wanted to study is, is memory, why didn't you study memory? Well, I got sidetracked by something else that was going to be a, a problem. Well, I did come back to memory. 
And for another 10 years, I did study memory, animal memory. We devised a paradigm modeled on the basis of something that Yurzi Konorsky had done with successive matching the sample rather than simultaneous matching the sample. It turns out to have been a, 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 a rich paradigm, and it provided a key insight into ways to arrange uh, training so that pigeons would show symmetry. So associative symmetry, showing a spontaneous backward association as well as a forward one. This had been a really hard task. Peter Riccioli and, and Murray Sidman had failed to get these effects, low by and large, uh, with most animals because of the problem of when you move the stimulus to one location for te these tests, it becomes a different stimulus. That problem doesn't arise when you present just a single stimulus at a time that can be affected or not packed. So uh, that gave us uh, another handle on uh, another issue that could come up later. Uh, throughout my uh, my forty some years doing this, I've discovered some tricks, and those tricks come back as I need them. And I see the, the, an opportunity to use them. If other people invent tricks, I'm more than happy to pay credit and, and use them as well. But uh, our bag of tricks is is really important. You'll say, do you have really big themes or big issues to study? And of course there are important themes. We all know what they are. I mean, how do animals store representations of the world? What is a representation to an animal? I mean, there are all kinds of interesting questions like that. But unless we have levers to pull, Right? We're not going to be able to answer these questions. So part of the issue is working on techniques, developing methods, seeing what's working in other areas like eye tracking, seeing the, the phenomena that have not been studied like contextual cueing. There are ways we can leverage these techniques and paradigms in ways that we can advance our field in ways that we haven't thus far. So I really, I'm kind of a methodologist at heart and trying to look to the methods to see how they can really help advance the questions that have always been there. Hell, when I started, we were using inline projectors, right? We didn't have uh, computers, uh, touch screens. We had the most primitive stuff. We were yearning for something to deliver us from these methodological shackles. And by George, we've got it now. And more will be on the way. We have to be opportunistic. We have to see that they can be leveraged and that we can really advance our field by exploiting them. So, so a lot of great insights, a lot of great comments. Is there anything else you want to talk about today? Gee, I think our field is at a, at a really interesting point. Uh, I see out there in the public incredible support and enthusiasm. We just published a paper my Russian colleagues and I on analogy in crows. This got put up on NBC's website under the very rich title, Weird Science. <laughs> but that weird science story helped prompt 100,000 YouTube visits to our page displaying how the crows were behaving and what this task amounted to. And vastly more thumbs up than thumbs down. Most of the thumbs down were because some of the people couldn't figure out the task that the crows were. <laughs> I'll let the others decide what that means. But there's an unbelievable thirst for more about animal intelligence from the popular community, just everyday people. You can't go to a party and be boring. If I were in physics still, I would be just a dud. But it's easy to let this our science do the talking. We do, however, have other challenges. We have many people in human cognition who still insist that we're just whistling in the wind, that none of this has much, if anything, to do with human cognition. We have neuroscientists who seem uh, to be locked in the 60s with step-down avoidance, and maybe now moving into the late 60s with idling conditioning. Uh, we, we have to do something to infiltrate that culture to help move our understanding of cognition ahead. After all, we want to be on their team. We don't want to be their, te you know, their technicians. We want to be guiding the questions uh, that, that, that are being answered. And of course, we can't very well ignore the fact that there are those arrayed against us and all other uh, biomedical researchers who happen to use animals in research. Our business isn't the exploitation of animals, it's the understanding of animals. 
it isn't the humanization of animals, it's giving animals the credit they deserve for what they are. Our job isn't to make them into people or to, to understand them as though they were people, right? It's to understand them the way they are. And then if we can understand another species in their place in nature, maybe we'll have the humility to better understand our place as well. So, awesome interview. Um, really enjoyed this. I want to thank you for your time today. Oh, it's a pleasure. And thank the Comparative Cognition Society for the, the chance to do this. I look forward to hearing many more interviews from um, more of our top scholars. Me too. Thank you.